Hi, I'm Doug Hayhoe, and I've written a series of short video essays and podcasts on science, faith, and other topics. This episode, Why Trust the Bible, and its complementary one, Why Trust Science, follow other episodes such as God's Two Books and How We Read God's Books. This episode answers the key question, why should I trust the Bible? In it, I discuss Scripture's reliability and authority. Science involves a methodical study of nature, not of a written communication from God, although nature is one of God's revelations to us. The Bible, on the other hand, is a collection of histories, prophecies, biographies, and letters written by various authors over many years that claims to be God's written word. It teaches us about our relationship with God and with each other, our meaning in life, and our final destiny. But why trust the Bible as reliable, given its diverse origin? And why trust it as God's voice to us? First, we'll discuss whether the Bible is reliable. For my last high school assignment, I had to memorize the translation from Latin to English of Caesar's Gallic War. I wasn't interested in how Caesar attacked the Gauls, who lived in France, Belgium, and Germany 2,000 years ago, although I knew it was a fact. I just wanted to pass the Latin course so I could get on with my science studies at university. Shortly after, I learned from F.F. Bruce's book, The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable?, that the Gallic War is only based on 9 or 10 good manuscripts, and the oldest of these only dates back to 900 years after the invasion of Gaul took place. Similarly, there are only 8 Greek manuscripts of the ancient book History of Thucydides, written between 460 and 400 BC, and the earliest manuscript belongs to 900 AD. Yet, no classic scholar questions the fact that Caesar did invade Gaul, or that Thucydides' history reflects on a real war between Athens and Sparta. When we come to the New Testament, it is almost embarrassing to compare it with these other ancient histories, for there are more than 5,000 Greek manuscripts in whole or in part of the New Testament, and another 10,000 Latin ones, and the earliest date back to the 4th and 5th centuries AD, twice as close to the events they describe as the earliest manuscripts of Caesar's Gallic War. Now, although there are thousands of variations in these Greek manuscripts, it is true, when experts examine them, they find disagreement on less than 1% of the text. And this 1% of of disagreement includes two major sections, Mark 16, part of Mark 16, and part of John 8, and a dozen other sections of one or two verses, and hundreds of tiny variations involving parts of a verse, or just a few words. What's important is this. These variations put no essential Christian belief in question. Even the biblical skeptic Bart Ehrman admits this, as Blomberg has pointed out in his book, Can We Still Believe the Bible? See the essay on my webpage for detailed references, by the way. So here are the two books I've referred to. On the left, F.F. Bruce, a renowned classic scholar, wrote the New Testament documents. Are they reliable? And on the right, Craig Blomberg, again, another renowned biblical scholar, wrote, Can We Still Believe the Bible? That was written quite recently in 2014. Manuscript reliability isn't just true of the New Testament. When the Dead Sea Scroll documents were discovered, many people were surprised to see how little they changed the text of the Old Testament. Previous to this, the oldest Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament dated back only a thousand years. Now we had a Hebrew manuscript that dated back over 2,000 years. Since Isaiah was always a favorite book of mine, I couldn't wait to read a good English translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls version of it. When I finally read it, I was surprised to see how few and small the changes really were. But what about the canon of the Bible? Does everyone agree on what the Bible should include? Almost all Christians agree on the 27 books of the New Testament. The Old Testament canon raises more questions. Although Protestants only accept the 39 books of the Hebrew Bible, the Apocrypha includes an additional 14 books written in Greek. They describe Jewish history and teaching in the centuries prior to Christ, 1st and 2nd Esdras, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, Tobit, Judith, Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, etc. Although the Protestant reformers Luther and Calvin originally included the books of the Apocrypha in their translations, they didn't give them the same authority as the 39 Hebrew books, and they were later dropped from most Protestant Bibles. 
The Catholic Church still maintains the Apocrypha as an important part of the Old Testament, and the Orthodox Church regards the books as worthy of reading. I've read them myself with interest. The histories of the brave Maccabees, for example, is quite compelling. It tells the story of the Jewish leaders who resisted to death the paganism that Antiochus, the Syrian ruler, tried to impose on the Jews. None of the books in the Apocrypha, however, claim to be God's word, and none are quoted directly in the New Testament, although some may be referred to there. The manuscript reliability of the Bible and the formation of its canon are fully discussed in Craig Blomberg's book, Can We Still Believe the Bible?, which I referred to earlier. This book also addresses related issues such as the Bible's historical accuracy, the multiplicity of English translations, and the nature of biblical genres. Blomberg includes many references to important scholarly works in his book. In fact, as I mentioned, he himself is an acclaimed research scholar. Greg Gilbert's book, Why Trust the Bible, written in 2017, covers the same ground in a shorter and more readable form. And similarly, Amy or Ewing's Why Trust the Bible answers to 10 tough questions, updated in 2020. Here's a picture of the cover of those two books. If you want a book that's easier to read, but covers a lot of the same ground. I'll now discuss the second question, is the Bible authoritative? The first thing to consider is this. The Bible itself claims to be God's word. When Moses gave the law and the Ten Commandments to Israel, he began by saying, and God wrote all these words, not and Moses wrote all these words. That's in Exodus 20. The rest of the Old Testament often refers back to the books of Moses and the law as having supreme authority written by God. Psalm 1, for example, begins with, Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord, not the law of Moses. The prophets also spoke as if they were the voice of the Lord. Quote, Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine. That's in Isaiah chapter 30. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul said, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3. And the Apostle Peter said, Prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's how they could be human, um, with errors themselves, but as they wrote Scripture, they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's in 2 Peter chapter 2. And when Peter refers to Paul's New Testament letters, he says, Paul's letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures, 2 Peter 3. In other words, Peter considered Paul's New Testament letters as scripture, even though the two authors didn't always agree, as you can see from Galatians chapter 2. Christ himself always took the Bible as being authoritative. When he was tempted by Satan in the desert at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus said, Jesus answered each temptation by quoting from Deuteronomy, saying, It is written. When he was approaching the cross at the end of his ministry, Jesus didn't shy away from suffering its terrible agonies, for the Old Testament prophets had foretold it. You can see that in Luke 18. And in his last meeting with his disciples, Jesus taught them that when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, in John's Gospel, chapter 16. Here, Jesus was referring to God's Spirit enabling the New Testament authors to write God's authoritative word. Here's a second thing to consider. For over 2,000 years, we have the personal experience of multitudes of Christians who read the Bible and heard God's authoritative voice speaking to them. One of these was the great philosopher and Christian leader, St. Augustine, who underwent a spiritual conversion in 400 AD while reading from the Book of Romans. You can see my episode, The Legacy of St. Augustine, for more details on this. My own personal experience, perhaps yours also, has been the same. So many times when I read the scriptures, I experience God speaking directly to my heart and conscience. When I'm in difficulty or when I'm sorrowing, it gives encouragement and comfort of God's love and presence. And above all, it assures me of a sure and certain hope when my present life ends. You can see this in Hebrews 6, verse 19, and Colossians 1, verse 5. Finally, we can think presuppositionally. In my early years as a science teacher and youth evangelist, Francis Schaeffer's book, 
He is there and he is not silent, referring to God. Help me greatly in handling the objections thrown at me by quick young minds. One of Schaeffer's arguments that stands out was the question of presuppositions. How did everything begin in the first place? By everything, we mean everything, not just the physical universe. This is where we have to begin with some presupposition, something we assume without proving as a logical starting point. There are only a few strong choices to make as our starting point. Schaeffer mentioned four possible ones, but really only two had any substance as far as I was concerned. Either everything began with a random explosion of raw energy and the laws of physics, i.e. the Big Bang, before which there was nothing, or everything began with an all-powerful personal God who created the vast universe, perhaps 13 billion years ago, but then he also created us persons in his image. If we choose the first presupposition, the idea of a divine revelation seems ridiculous. There is no God. But if we choose as a starting point the existence of an infinite personal God, a divine revelation makes perfect sense. For if God is infinite, he can surely figure out how to communicate with us. And if he is personal, he would surely want to communicate with persons made in his image. And this is what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11. Let's look at that. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So we start, by faith we choose the presupposition that God exists and that he made the universe. And we're going to see also in that he's a personal God who cares for us. We see that in verse 6, the same chapter. Without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, God exists, an infinite personal God, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. He's also a personal God as well as an infinite God. So, through faith, we begin with a creator God who made everything and wants to communicate with us. The final point. Ultimately, our acceptance of Scripture as Christians involves the Lordship of Christ. If we believe Jesus is the Son of God, which he claimed to be many times, you can see my episode, The Greatest Book Ever Written, on John's Gospel. If we believe that Jesus died and was raised from the dead, we are faced with a decision. Are we willing to confess Christ as Lord, as it says in Romans 10, verse 9? If so, how is Jesus' Lordship to be worked out in our lives unless we accept the authority of his words? This includes the words of the Bible that Jesus endorsed. The Bible is not a science textbook. But in the areas in which it is authoritative, we need to give it the final word, just as Jesus did. Otherwise, we elevate ourselves above him. Thank you for listening. To pursue further reading on this topic, see the books listed at the bottom of this essay on my webpage.